Hello, 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 and welcome. This is Calvin's Crusade, episode two. Uh, thank you for joining me once again. Uh, really good, exciting show coming up today. I'm going to be speaking with Isabel Vaughan Spruce about the horrible incident that happened uh, in, in the week just gone, where a woman has been arrested for praying on the streets of the United Kingdom. It's, it's out, outrageous, gobsmacking, and we'll get all the details on that. I'm also going to be speaking later to Lois McClashey, from uh, the ADF. She's a human rights lawyer who can give us a different perspective on this matter too. So we're going to get to the crux of the matter. Beforehand, I have a homily for you guys that I've prepared over Christmas. And we've got some new graphics as well. Here we go. <laughs> Look at that. How fancy is that? Love it. So Christmas is a special time of year. And after Vespers or evening prayer on Christmas Eve, Advent comes to an end and Christmas tide begins. We leave behind that period of spiritual reflection and preparation, and we enter the exuberant time of wonder and joy. Christ is born. Alleluia. Throughout the 12 days of Christmas, we recall the Nativity story, the greatest love story ever told. God fulfilled all his promises to mankind by bringing in the new covenant, he fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament by presenting us with the new, and he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, knowing full well what we would do with him, knowing full well what we would do to him. God humbled himself and became man incarnate to die on the cross for our sins. Like any good father would, knowing his children had committed grave sins, he chose to pay the penalty for us, not only to rid us of our sins, but so that we may have eternal life in him. God is love. And when we say God is love, we mean that God is a loving, everlasting relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit within the Trinity. By conquering death, God invites us into that ever-loving relationship. That is the reason that we were created. And although we have free will and the choice to take the Almighty up on his offer or not, that is our ultimate purpose, to join God in his heavenly kingdom. It often feels like people have forgotten the meaning of Christmas and the obsession with Father Christmas or Santa and present giving is often looked down upon by some of us Christians. But I think it's important that we remind ourselves that this is low hanging fruit actually. So long as people are celebrating Christmas, they're celebrating the birth of Christ. And even if they are only doing so in a secular manner, they are only moments away from opening their hearts to him. After all, the name Father Christmas as with anything Christmassy, is invoking the name of our Lord and Saviour, Christ Mass. We should encourage its use as much as possible, especially in the face of ever-increasing demands to rebrand this special time as Happy Holidays, or the worst one I've heard so far, Happy Winter Closure Period. As for the common nickname Santa Claus, this is just another name for Saint Nicholas, an important saint who we venerate during the Advent period. He was a holy man who spent his vast fortunes giving gifts to needy children. And the gift giving is an inherently Christian thing to do. It's a value of charity that is embedded in the scriptures. Not long after Jesus' birth in the nativity story, we hear of the Magi bringing gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And the nativity story itself is about a great gift. God giving us the gift of his only begotten son. And of course, it doesn't stop there. He gives us the gift of eternal life in him. And prior to that, he gives us his grace through the sacraments. So the next time we hear our non-Christian friends talking about the lovely presents that they either gave or received at Christmas, let's use that as an opportunity to remind them of the greatest gift they'll ever receive, the love of our Lord. Happy Christmas. Now, I am very pleased to say I am joined by Isabel Vaughan Spruce. Isabel, good evening to you. Happy Christmas. And to you, Calvin. Lovely to be on. How was your Christmas celebration yesterday? Oh, I'm still enjoying it. Yes, I love Christmas. <laughs> yeah, good time. I've got a mimosa for you right here. <laughs> <laughs> it seems we all, all have drunk over Christmas so far, but today is obviously the second day of Christmas since Stephen's Day. So I uh, just wanted to put that out there as well for people that think Christmas is over as of yesterday. Um, so you've obviously had an interesting time this past week or so. And I've, I've been observing on social media and in the press, well, from what the press have covered of your story, 
Uh, and there have been a lot of attacks as well as a lot of support. It seems to be an issue that's really, really divided people. So I wanted to get really to the crux of the matter, get your personal perspective on what's happened to you and around you and let people make up their own minds, really. Because every time I've talked about it publicly, people have said, you're a liar, you're spreading misinformation, Calvin. I'm like, well, how, what, what am I lying about and what's the misinformation? It seems to me that there is a trench of people that don't actually want the truth to be out there. And we'll get to, the, we'll get to why we think that might be. So I thought if we break this conversation down, Isabel, if we talk about the technical side of things first, before we get to the issue of, of prayer or abortion, and then we can actually see what we're working with. So if you could fill me in on, on where you were and what, what practically happened, that would be a great start, please. So it's probably helpful if I just maybe um, just give a little bit of background and explain that in September this year, um, Birmingham City Council brought in what's called um, a PSPO, a public space protection order around the Roberts Clinic in Birmingham, which is an abortion centre. Um, so public space protections orders were, were formally used for things like, you know, dog fouling or drunk and disorderly behaviour to prohibit certain activities taking place but in more recent years they've also been used to create these kind of um zones around abortion centers that prohibit certain activities so they've sprung up um in in various places in london in bournemouth in manchester and as i say in september there was one introduced by the council in birmingham around the roberts clinic so just to make it clear a pspo doesn't ban people it's not like a restraining order that, that might stop a person going somewhere or, or meeting someone. It prohibits certain behaviour. I think um, that's an important important first marker as well, because a lot of people have been saying, well, there's a PSPO against Isabel. She shouldn't have been there in the first place. The PSPO is wide branching and it counts for everyone within that exclusion zone or buffer zone, doesn't it? Yeah, so that that is a really key point. It doesn't say, like I say, this person or that person can't go in that area. It's still a, a public space. So the public is still allowed in that area. It just means certain behavior is prohibited in that area within a certain distance from the abortion center. Um, and one of the key types of behavior that is mentioned is protesting. Um, but when it explains in the order what protesting is, it says um, prayer and counseling as forms of protest. Um, which clearly would would um, raise eyebrows with certain people, I think, that, that prayer or counselling would be classed as protest or forms of prayer and counselling. Um, so four times I have been inside the PSPO area and silently prayed near a, the closed abortion centre. And So another important point that you mentioned there, that the abortion centre was closed while you were in the vicinity. So it was, yes. Um, and on the last occasion that I was there, the police came and they asked me if I was protesting. I explained I wasn't. They asked if I was praying. And I said that I might be praying in my head. And I was then arrested. And well, we've actually got the footage that we can show, actually. Let's, let's yeah. have a look. Um, before I ask you any questions about what's going on today, I have to caution you, which is just your rights, which is you do not have to say anything. It may harm your defence if you do not mention one question, something that you later on in court, anything you do say may be given you. Uh, what, what are you here for today? Uh, physically, I'm just standing here. Okay. Why, why here of all places? I know you, you don't live nearby. But this is an abortion centre. Okay, that's why you're stood here. Is, is you standing here part of a protest? No, I'm not are you, protesting. Are you, are you praying? I might be praying in my head. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you once more, will you voluntarily come with us now to the police station for me to ask you some questions about today and other days where there are allegations that you've broken public space of protection? Uh, if I've got a choice, then no. Okay, well then you're under arrest. I can't suspicion of failing to comply with the public space of protection order, which is under the uh, Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act 2014. Now, of course, you again, you don't have to say anything. It may harm your defence if you do not mention one question, something which you later on in court, anything you do say may be given. Do you understand the caution? I do. Okay, so they clearly asked you, are you protesting? You said no. They said, are you praying? And you said you might be praying in your head. I'm, I'm blown away by the fact that they're even asking people if they're praying. But that from the PSPO, we see that prayer might be a form of protest or considered such under these PSPOs. 
Um, you were praying silently. They took you away. What happened next? Were you charged? So they took me to the police station. Obviously, initially locked me in a cell for a while. Um, and I was then interviewed or interrogated, however you want to see it. So they asked me during the interview um, whether I was praying. And I told them that I was praying at that time. And they wanted to know what I was praying. So these police officers are asking me what is in my head. I even kind of clarified that and said, are you asking me what I was praying? And they said, yes. So I told them what I was praying at the time, what my thoughts were. Um, they released me on bail on that occasion. And later on, I was recalled to the police station and told I was being charged on four counts. So I've been charged with breaching the PSPO on four accounts now. Okay, so that's um, also another important point because people have been saying you've been charged four times before and then you've turned up to this incident and been arrested and charged. The, the fact is you were arrested at this point and then later charged for four counts. And that's so right, does, yes. Right. So does that account for the four visits that you've paid to this? The four visits. So um, just to say that people um, maybe have been asking how the police knew that there's there's locals who took photographs so when i was at the police station i was provided with various photographs of myself standing you know there'd be one photograph with my hands in my pockets one with me i don't know looking at my phone or whatever i happened to be doing while um in between my prayers um and this was the evidence that was supplied to me i had to you know verify that it was myself in the photographs yeah. which i did um, so that's how the police know I was there. People took photographs and um, contacted the police and let them know that I was there. Um, and, and so this time, did you take your own photographer with you? I saw the video footage that we just played. Was that your friend recording that? So someone, someone else, yes, recorded that. We felt it was important to make sure that there was, um, you know, someone there recording that incident. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's get on to onto your charity work because of course one of the reasons people will have known who you were and have been taking sneaky photographs of you in the area is because you're known as someone who uh, campaigns for life for the sanctity of life you are involved in if not the founder of march for life that's right so i am involved in march for life but i think maybe in that area they would particularly have known me because i run an organization called 40 days for life in birmingham um, so some people might already be familiar with that name. It's a um, very large international pro-life organisation. takes place in cities all around the world. Um, it happens twice a year. So it happens during the, the period of Lent leading up to Easter. And it also happens again in the autumn time. So the cities all around the world run this at the same time. And so for 40 con consecutive days, people would um, be voted to go and pray outside the abortion centre. So I run the campaign in Birmingham. So I would organise the rota and I would make sure that during that period, people go maybe in groups of two or three. We don't have big crowds or anything like that and go and pray and offer help outside the abortion centre. We don't have any posters or placards there. We have some leaflets which offer help um, and alternatives to women. And I know well over 100 women who have accepted that help. These are women who sometimes, you know, had a first abortion appointment and clearly maybe not received that help at that first appointment that they felt they needed. Yeah. Sometimes they've even had the first set of abortion pills, but on speaking to us and being offered real alternatives have felt able to continue their pregnancies. And obviously we've supported them through their pregnancy and beyond for as long as they need it. And I've had the great privilege and blessing of, of seeing many, many of these children um, that have been born because the women were presented with a real choice. Um, it's not that they wanted an abortion, some of these women, some of them just felt they had no other options um, and, and we were able to provide that option to them. So yeah. everyone who comes as part of our campaign signs what's called a statement of peace. Um, so they agree to behave the law and behave um, you know, peacefully and, and lovingly towards people that they meet. Um, and as I say, I wrote to them to come and stand outside the abortion centre, we still stand a short distance from the door, um, from the gateway, and just um, offer a leaflet to somebody if they want help. Um, so, so, so what would you say to people who say you're harassing people, vulnerable people that are going into these centres? If that was the case, we wouldn't have so many women taking up our offers of help. And I wish they'd talk to some of the women who have been helped um, yeah. and have accepted that help. 
um, asking somebody if they want a leaflet or if they want help, um, clearly that that's not harassment. But that is just to make it clear, that's not what I was arrested for. I was not holding any leaflets. I spoke to nobody. As you say, the abortion centre was closed. So just to make it clear, those are two separate things, if you like. That's like you say, you're quite right. That's why people in the area might have known me. But that is not what I was doing on those occasions. Um, I, I believe we should be able to offer help to women going into abortion centres. Um, I think women have a right to know that there is alternatives, that there are alternatives, um, that there is help available if they want it. They've also got, a, you know, they can choose to ignore that help if they want to. And many, many don't take up our offers. Many walk past and don't take our leaflets. Um, and, and they can choose to do that. But I think it's very important that they have that offer there if they want it. Um, so, and as I so say, this many... is the point for me that I've seen the, the number of people attacking you this week have been people that are unhappy that this is around abortion. So they, they will not acknowledge that you were arrested for prayer or for even being asked about prayer by the police. They won't acknowledge the fact that you were not protesting, that you were silently stood there minding your business, uh, saying prayers for people because you care about the situation, you care about the people. It seems to me, I mean, correct me if you think I'm wrong, that people are unhappy about this because you are offering a choice. And these women that are going to this, these centres are not really offered a choice. Uh, we, we hear that the other side of the argument is all about pro-choice, but actually it's become a bit pro-abortion at this point. And they will double down that the people that are pro-abortion until, until people like yourself are arrested and silenced. And this is why they're not fighting for your freedom of worship or fighting for your freedom of speech because they genuinely want to see you silenced because it supports their own argument. It's interesting though, Kevin, the amount of support I've had from people who say at the moment, they're saying, you know, I support abortion or I would call myself pro-choice, but I do have concerns about this. And that is something that I find very encouraging at the moment, that people are realising that this is bigger or, or, or this is separate and different to whether we agree with abortion or not. Okay. It's freedom of thought here that is that is on the line. And I think a lot of people have concerns realising that whatever they think about abortion, they realise that somebody should be allowed to think whatever they want to think and wherever they want to think it. Um, well, I'm glad people that... are, are saying that because that's what's most important. I've, I've asked people if they wanted to ask you questions directly. So I'll pull up some questions. In a moment, we've got uh, Lois McClatchy coming in from the ADF. But before we get to that, let's have some questions from the audience. <laughs> Now, let's see if you can see that. Um, on the subject of abortion, I believe that when sperm enters the egg, I haven't seen these questions, by the way, uh, is the start of a new life and a new human soul. Uh, that tiny, undeveloped person could be a musical genius on par with Bach. Question, who are we to decide who lives and who dies? Good first question. Uh, a lot of people use language to kind of, well, in human language to... to put a barrier between us and the baby. And what we're talking about when we're saying we're pro-life, and I'm, I'm including myself in this because I, I support you 100% in this battle, in that we're arguing in favor of all human life as being sacred. But but people will say, actually, that's not a baby, that's a, that's a fetus. Or they'll say it's not yet life until it's got a heartbeat. In answer to this, this chap's question, who are we to decide who lives and who dies? Yeah, and it's it's really good to get back to the heart of what we're talking about here. Um, when you're talking about abortion and that is you know what does it mean to be pregnant and so often we get carried away with points that are further down the line you know maybe like you know what about if a woman is raped and gets pregnant or is it a man's issue and really we have to take it back to that starting point of what does it mean to be pregnant and 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 like this gentleman is is explaining that when a sperm and an egg meets this is this is a scientific fact that a genetically complete, unique human individual is created that's distinct from both mother and father. Um, and, and that's not politics, that's not religion, that's science. So that should be something that we can all agree on. Um, we can it's call it- own unique, sorry, go on. I was well, going to say, it's own unique can... DNA, so it's a different person. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and and, and as, as you say, that, that's a scientific statement. And, you know, initially it might be a zygote or then an embryo or a fetus, but these are just names for different stages in human development, just as we might 
call a, a child, a, you know, a newborn, an infant, a toddler, or, you know, an adolescent. Mm. Uh, a toddler isn't less of a human than a teenager and an embryo isn't less of a human than a fetus or a newborn. They're just different stages. Um, so humans don't have less value because of how small they are or how developed or less developed they are. A human life is human life is human life. Uh, and again, like this, this gentleman was bringing up about, we never know who this person might turn out to be. I think I think it's also important to, to, to make that, that point that no matter who they are, and, and it's not a question of what we can do. Yes, they may, might be a great musician. I don't know, maybe this person might end up lying on a hospital bed for the whole of their life because they've got some terrible condition. They might end up feeling that they haven't contributed to society because of certain things that set them back. They still have that right to Doesn't life. Matter. No matter. We can't trust the value of that person's life. I like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. That's, that's really, really key. And, and, and any of us are human beings would hopefully not want to be judged just on what we do, but just on who we are as well. Yeah. There's a chap here, um, Highland Hedgy, seems to be saying what you were saying earlier. Uh, he's not a supporter of abortion. Uh, the whole area idea is sickening. However, the issue here is actually about people's rights to uh, the exclusion zones, about it's being a nonsense and people should be able to hold a silent vigil, just one person or two people ready to pray for the baby's soul and the mother's last chance to reach help. Very important. But uh, moving on as well to Cabrini200, who says, what does an abortion to the mother's soul or what does it do to a mother's soul? And I think that's something that's often overlooked. I've been to some of your marches and spoken to people who have had abortions, women who have had abortions, and, and the trauma, the impact it's had on their lives, and they're not told about that. Because when they're, when they're asked if they want to make the choice uh, to keep the baby or not, they're asked if it will impact their mental health to keep the baby, rather than asking what impact it might have to, to not keep the baby. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I always think that the damage abortion inflicts on women alone should be enough to make us pro-life. The amount of women and men that I speak to who've been affected by abortion, um, it, it's really it's like it's so holistic the way the way, you know, whether it's whether we're talking about, you know, mental health, whether we're talking about um, our physical health, our emotional or spiritual health, and sometimes even not not necessarily immediately noticed sometimes women can um maybe suppress certain things you know and it's as the decades roll on that women can realize that this this pain isn't going away you know this is something that is that is really hurting me um i know i was talking to um, my friend rachel who runs rachel's vineyard which is an organization that helps anyone who's been hurt by abortion and um, she was telling me through lockdown, she had an unprecedented amount of people contacting her. And I think part of the reason for that was that there wasn't the usual distractions that there are in life. People maybe were confronted with those um, painful thoughts or that hurt that was inside them. Um, and they realized they needed to address that, which in a way was good um, to take that first step. Um, and I just know from speaking to so many women how deep that hurt can be. And one of the sad things, of course, we're seeing at the moment is because of the DIY home abortions that were introduced. We're seeing how many women um, are affected by actually seeing their child um, when they have an abortion at home. You know, that is something often that can stay with them forever. I know my friend uh, Natalia, who spoke out very bravely at one of the March for Life's, how she had an abortion um a diy abortion and ended up seeing that child down her toilet and that's clearly an image that's going to remain with her forever she saw that it was a child she'd been told it would just be a clump of cells you know um just a blob of tissue it wasn't it wasn't it was her I son i really hate that phrase because aren't we all just a clump of cells really at the end of the day uh, i'm going to bring lois mcclatchy in human rights lawyer and comms officer for the adf Good evening, Lois. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas to you too. Um, I want to bring the conversation back to, to the law and the legal side of this because it is such a minefield. The, and these PSPOs, especially the one in Birmingham, uh, the council, I believe, put this into law in September. That's now, right. Just to clarify, Calvin, I myself yeah. am not a British lawyer. I have studied the law and I have been looking at this uh, issue particularly closely, so I'm very happy to speak into it, uh, the issue of this PSPO that was brought in by the council, and it has indeed be, 
brought in by several councils across the UK so far, I believe it's five. Um, PS moves, as, as Isabel um, explained already so well, have been used to combat antisocial behaviour in many different forms. There's one that was brought in during the wedding of Harry and Meghan uh, to make sure that there wasn't homeless people sleeping in the streets where, where Harry and Meghan were going to be celebrating their wedding. Um, that was very controversial at the time and eventually was removed. There's been another one brought in, uh, I think it's Salford Keys, where they made it, um, they banned swearing and, and kind of foul language, and that was very controversial as well. Um, so these kind of evolved from uh, tackling antisocial behaviour and now uh, have been implemented as a measure to tackle people who are simply pro-life. Um, they're often campaigned for and explained for as a method to ban harassment. And I can speak for myself as a pro-lifer, and much in pro-life, and, and I'm very much sure, certain that Isabel believes this as well, <laughs> that nobody ever should be harassed at any point, least of all a woman who is heading into an abortion facility. In fact, no woman should ever face harassment at any street. And we all very much stand against that. And that's something I really want to make clear to anyone who has questions about this case, is that everybody stands against harassment. But as we've seen in the case of Isabel and in all of the PSPOs that have been brought in uh, around abortion facilities, these go much, much further. Uh, they ban things that are absolutely peaceful and lawful, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, prayer, uh, simply praying to God uh, has now become something that's become a criminal offence, um, which is something that's is very concerning for a democratic society. But this wasn't the plan, was it? These PSPOs, as you mentioned, were supposed to be preventing antisocial behaviour. And we've seen councils adapting them recently for these buffer zones. We've now got a couple of buffer zones, and it seems to me that these are a trial, and the plan would be to expand them across the country. But they're being used specifically to target pro-life and even pro-choice people so that vigils cannot take place. It's not about protest, is it? It's not about harassment. It's about a political stance. How is that legal? How is that being allowed? That's right. In fact, if you look at the wording uh, of the PSBO in Birmingham, it talks about expressions of approval or disapproval uh, of abortion and anything that could be counted on it. Now, I don't think that, I mean, standing with, you know, no expression on your face, praying, praying in your head, I don't think that even amounts to expressing approval or disapproval. Um, but yet that law is so incredibly expansive. And let me touch on something that you said at the start, uh, Calvin, about this spreading out across the country. PSBOs are getting more common, but almost an, in a more urgent matter, the government are actually considering rolling out buffer zones, as they call censorship zones, the same kind that are being brought in by PSPOs. They're considering rolling out these censorship zones across the country in a bill that's going through parliament right as we speak. It's called the uh, Public Order Bill. And Clause 9 would ban any, um, not only harassment, of course, but um, expressing opinion, um, occupying space, advising, persuading, informing, not misinforming, not spreading disinformation, but merely informing, giving information that simply the authorities the government don't approve of, don't agree with, uh, would be a criminal act. Um, and that's something very concerning. I think um, Isabel's case has brought to light how severe, far-reaching, disproportionate and unnecessary these buffer zones are. And I, I really want politicians to be paying attention to this to see what can happen when we when we meddle with freedom of speech, when we restrict uh, freedom of religion unnecessarily and disproportionately and, and take heed before this legislation goes through uh, in the new year. Well, you've both been very generous with your time. And before I let Isabel go, Lois, what are the chances? What do, where do you think this, the direction of this case is going to go? Why we have to leave to the courts to decide that um, there will be a court case at the start of February and we'll just have to, to see how the court uh, make their decision um, but it's definitely something that we should be looking at the wider picture of um, and how this affects uh, what the government policies will be going forward if they will stand up and indeed uh, protect and defend uh, the freedom of speech of expression the right to offer help the right to pray that we all have in a democracy and if they'll make a move to to protect that absolutely and isabel do you have anything you'd like to say to our audience i just really like to encourage people to pray for this you know if you are people of faith then we need a lot of prayer behind this because um as has been mentioned by lois this is something that could have implications on all of us you know i'm sure we've all got our own particular principles or, or beliefs that we hold dear who knows when they're going to fall out of favor with those who are making laws and they're going to be things that we can't talk about or can't even think about 
So let's let's pray that we don't go any further down this road and that laws that have come into place that um, maybe are very questionable are revoked. Thank you very much for that. That's Isabel Vaughan Spruce. And I believe people can support you on the ADF website as well. That's right. ADF.uk slash support hyphen Isabel. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for coming on, Isabel. Happy Christmas again. Thank you, Calvin. Happy Christmas. Now, Lois, I want to draw your attention, if you don't mind, to the EHCR, something that I talk about quite often in terms of something that we should get rid of because human rights lawyers often use it um, against our immigration policy. However, it can come in our favour sometimes. And if we look at briefly here, uh, Article 9, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, the highlighted section here, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his re religion or belief and freedom, either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice and observance. Now, it's, I'm no lawyer, but it seems to me that there's clearly a breach of Article 9 going on here. W would you tend to concur with that? One of the key questions uh, about Isabel's case and about this issue in the wider um, in the wider realm is RPSPO is lawful in accordance with protecting those rights. Um, if they are, uh, if it is correct that they can be used to ban silent prayer said inside one's head, then that does seem to be disproportionately interfering with freedom of thought, conscience and belief, which is a protected international human right. If we look across the globe, the UK are often the ones who are pointing the fingers or, um, or it's right, rightfully standing against countries that are condemning things like blasphemy and saying like it's wrong to put people in prison for what they believe if that's in the Middle East or South Asia, different countries. Uh, and we're saying that no, everybody um, should be you know, able to think what they want, believe what they want and freely about their faith. But at home, how is this going to play out? In our own country, how are we going to be leading uh, leading reputation for democratic values if we ourselves are putting gracious and lovely and uh, isn't that just demonstrated by her interview such a gracious and lovely woman like Isabel into prison for praying? Uh, this is not a British value. This is not defending what we are built on. Our country is built on, uh, and it's something that I really hope that Isabel's case. Uh, brings a bit of momentum to to raise the problem of PSPOs, the problem of um, yeah, narrowing freedom of religion, freedom of thought, conscious and belief, and, and make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. And you just mentioned there, and can I get a clarification? That I've, I've been saying that Isabel was arrested for praying, and people have been saying, you're lying, this is misinformation, this is not what happened. Can you just clarify it for us? You've, you've researched this case. What was Isabel arrested mm, absolutely. for? Absolutely. Isabel was arrested for breaking the PSPO, she was arrested for breaking the PSPO through silently praying. Um, so had she not been silently praying, she would not have been arrested. Um, so it, it's a very clear cut case. Nobody, uh, ADF, uh, yourself, Calvin, nobody is saying there's no PSPO. We're all very much clear yeah. that there was a PSPO uh, involved. And that is the reason why she was arrested because she was silently praying. Now, if we contrast that, for example, um, if two people had been in the PSPO, if someone had been stood next to Isabel and they had been loudly, aggressively campaigning for something on a different topic, let's say climate change. If someone had been making aggressive noises and a, a very distressing display of protest about climate change and Isabel had been standing there right next to them and simply praying, not showing any emotion on her face, not portraying an opinion, but praying within the privacy of her own mind. The person that would have got arrested that day is Isabel. These PSPOs are very clearly motivated against people who hold pro-life viewpoints and opinions. Um, and it's, you know, it's seen as something that could be, the, the defense of it is that uh, we don't want to upset people who would uh, see a pro-lifer, see someone who holds a pro-life view at a very emotional moment and, and feel distressed or upset by that. Um, of course, we can see that Isabel is not a distressing or intimidating person in, in the slightest. Her motivations were not to do anything of the sort. And in fact, her record of charitable help and support for women who have turned away from abortion or who have had abortions is testament to her great character. And um, so it's very clear that this incident, um, this PSPO, would have disproportionately criminalised Isabel over somebody who was being far more disruptive. 
But okay, so let's take the abortion out of the situation just for a minute. Uh, the, the, the the abortion clinic or center. Let's take that out of the equation. Being there and praying wouldn't I? I don't think would upset anyone that's vulnerable wherever they were going, whatever they're going to do, because uh, praying isn't an offensive action. It's not a, an active protest. It's literally passive, and it's someone communicating between themselves and their God. So it does. To me, it doesn't matter where the praying is taking place or, or what the praying is about. It's it's the act of, of silencing someone's prayer that I'm, I'm struggling with. And the fact that the police asked Isabel, what were you praying about? It gives it another layer of context, doesn't it? Prayer is never harassment. And I would even say that thought is never harassment because it can't be heard. There's no way that thought could be found offensive or distressing because who can hear it? Nobody even knows you know, what I'm thinking about you right now, Kevin. How can, <laughs> how can that possibly ever? How could that? How could it possibly ever be a crime? Don't make me laugh. I'm getting over this cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I think if we take a step back, um, and Isabel said it so well. This isn't about abortion, really. This is about thought. You can be pro-life. You can be pro-choice, uh, pro-abortion, but. For saying some, that somebody should be arrested and charged simply for thinking something, no matter even if you disagree with what they're thinking, is surely obviously far excessive and, and completely unthinkable, ironically, in a democratic society. Absolutely. I'm 100% with you. I think you've clarified the situation far better than I could. So thank you very much for your time today. That's Lois McClatchy, hum, um, comms officer for ADF. Cheers. Merry thank Christmas. you, Gavin. I'm still gobsmacked by the entire case, and I'm, I'm going to go over some more comments that you guys have been sending in, because I know you guys have been outraged just as I am. But before I do, I want to address a particular issue around men. So I am obviously a man, obviously having a conversation about abortion, and quite often I hear, you're not allowed to, no woman, uh, sorry, no womb, no voice, no uterus, no voice. And I find that highly dismissive, highly offensive, not that it matters that it's offensive, but it's just the point that people are trying to shut down debate. I'm a man. Yes, I give you that. I will never give birth to a child. I give you that. But men are involved in the childbirth situation. You know, it takes two to tango. It is not possible to create another human being without a man. Therefore, I think men should be involved in the conversation. I think if men were involved in the conversation more often, we wouldn't get to as many sticky situations as we're in right now. And what we do know is that there have been 10 million abortions since the Abortion Act came into place in 1967. We know that there are over 200,000 abortions every year at the moment, and that's increasing. So we know that actually abortion has become a convenience. And what might have started uh, for rare extreme cases of incest, rape, and protecting the mother's life, what might have started for that reason is no longer the case. There are not over 200,000 instances of that anymore. What's going on is people are choosing to have sex for their own procreation, for their own pleasure. What they're not choosing to do is to consider what the consequences of that are. So rather they'll live their lives as they see fit, in a liberal society, everyone can do what they like. But then the choice that's being made is whether to keep the baby or not. Surely, for a secular person, the choice should be made of whether to use contraception or not. For a religious person, it should be whether to have sex outside of marriage or not. If you wait until marriage before you have sex, the consequences are a family. That is a good thing. That's procreation. Some would say that's what the whole thing is for. However, let's have a look at what you guys have been saying. Uh, Susan BBPM. Now, I think she's been a vocal opposition of uh, opponent of mine on Twitter. So let's go with hers because I like to have some challenge. Uh, a hypothetical to perhaps discuss or think about. In groups of activists, if groups of activists took exception to religion, be that Christian, Muslim, Jew, and took to protesting outside of churches with a view to show the congregation the error of their ways, how would you feel about a buffer or exclusion zone around the church? Remember, many people going to church are fragile and vulnerable. Again, there's that word. Any protest, no matter how silent, could well make them afraid to attend church, perhaps at a time when their very survival depends upon it. If this situation occurred, would you, would your proposed solution, what would your proposed solution be to help the vulnerable get to church safely and without trauma? Right. I do not believe in buffer zones or exclusion zones. I do not believe in telling people you cannot go to a certain place or you cannot, what you can think within that certain place. I think that is abhorrent anti-Christian, anti-British, anti-Western, anti-freedom. It's actually quite a fascist idea to say you are not allowed to think certain things in this area. 
I can't imagine that ever being okay. So even if I do have a church in Northwest London, if there are people that wanted to protest about the error of our ways outside of our church, it might be pretty uncomfortable, depending on how they protested. But I think if they were stood by silently praying, I'd be fine with it. Uh, but if they were having a very vocal protest with placards and everything, I'd probably want to talk to them and debate them and, and find out what the issue is. However, I would not at any point condone the idea of banning them and banning their thoughts and their prayers. So the, the hypothetical doesn't work, I'm sorry. But this whole, per, this whole idea that people are too vulnerable to see certain things or vo too vulnerable to hear certain things, we're wrapping up the world in, in cotton wool. And I think if people are too vulnerable to, to, to walk down the street without seeing someone else pray, they need prayer. They need extra prayer, actually, to give them strength and courage and, and to give them whatever support they need. But also what we're talking about really and truly is people on the way to abortion centers. And if people are on the way to abortion centers, they're already in a difficult place. They might need other options that they haven't been made aware of. And the fact that we are only promoting abortion and not promoting the idea of the sanctity of life and giving people other options, just as Isabel and her group does, it, it's very, very sad. Let's have a look at a couple more questions. When is DNA when is DNA formed and when do their rights begin? The questions removes the religious pushback claims. Hashtag science. When is DNA formed? I think when do their rights begin? I don't like the whole idea of rights because what what is a right? Are the, but the, the problem here is that DNA is formed straight away. You know, and the life begins straight away. That life begins at conception, and yeah. So science and religion are both joined in that argument people keep saying end it now are we sure the government see that the riots going on i'm not sure what's in relevance to uh, ab 51 says the government won't stop the illegal immigration which is destroying the country or stop government sanctioned abortions legal murder from happening there is no moral compass residing in the house of commons that is the crux of it thank you ab 51 this is legal murder this is legal killing this is what we're actually talking about and we use fancy words to make ourselves more comfortable with it. But what we're talking about is killing. And killing means ending something. We're talking about ending an unborn child, an unborn baby, an unborn human life prematurely. And I think what we actually need to do is look at why are we getting to that place in the first place? Why is it that so many individuals in this country are reaching the position that they think that's their only option? Is it because we're not looking after young women as, as well as we should be? Is it because we're not teaching young men about responsibility as much as we should be? Is it because we're not providing other options, whether that's abortion or helping with childcare, whether it's the costs or the practicalities of it? Why are the numbers of abortions rising whilst the number of divorces are rising and the numbers of the number of marriages is declining and the number of childbirths is declining? Something has gone inherently wrong in this country. Something is not right. Now, that was, that was a fascinating interview with Isabel and with Lois, actually. I, I thank them both for their time and, and running us through this situation. But I, I think it's very, very clear to us all now that Isabel was arrested for praying and because praying was the breach of the PSPOs. So all the people on social media or in the media that are saying, actually, you know, uh, she had several PSPOs against her, several court cases against her, et cetera. It's all, that is the lie. The people shouting lie are the liars. What happened was... This is a very peaceful, prayerful, holy woman that was standing silently praying, got stopped by the police, arrested, and later charged for breaching a PSO four times. Uh, the breach was silent prayer. The fact of the matter is that in this country right now, you can be arrested for praying. You can be arrested for the things you're thinking inside your own head. And the police will ask you, first of all, are you praying? And secondly, what were you praying about? I can't think of any circumstances where that should be acceptable where that should be okay and i think we all need to come together and fight against it before we wrap up let's take a couple more of your questions david Steele, uh mp who introduced the abortion bill went on to regret its implementation due to it being used as a convenient contraception i'm not surprised i didn't actually know that but i'm not surprised at all because that's what it has gone on to be uh, jack says were buffer exclusion zones first instituted to make life easier for the police but they appear to have been subverted for evil causes. I'd like to ask the policeman if he thinks he was doing the right thing. If he was only following orders, if the law was changed to shoot on sight, would he do that with the same compunction? How far is he prepared to go before he remembers he's a public servant, not the Stasi? 
I mean, you put it in very emotive language, Jack, but I tend to agree with you. I think it is quite evil. I think the argument that I'm just following orders is not okay. This is clearly an immoral law, stopping someone and asking them if they're praying and what they're praying and arresting them for it. And you're right, if they were told to shoot on sight, would they? I doubt they would. But the point is they shouldn't be following ridiculous orders. But even deeper than that, we shouldn't have these orders in place in the first place. Aaron says, PSPOs are covered by antisocial behavior legislation. What behaviors do police believe Isabel has engaged in that constitutes a breach of the PSPO? Under this and other PSPOs, prayer is considered a form of protest. Some PSPOs distinguish between audible prayer and prayer, ridiculously. Uh, this one doesn't. Clearly her apparently being in the PSPO standing silently praying is being used here on this occasion. Have any bail conditions been placed on Isabel that restrict her freedom? Uh, free movement and expression. I didn't get to ask that question. I'm sorry about that. But you're you're absolutely right in the rest of what you said in that this is the breach of the PSPO was prayer and prayer is considered a form of protest. Whether audible or silent, it should never because it's not protest. It's communication with one's God. That's outrageous. Now I'm going to pull out my book of common prayer and read the collect for today. We are on Boxing Day in the UK or St. Stephen's Day if you're a Christian. And the collect for today is, grant, O Lord, that in all our sufferings here upon earth, for the testimony of thy truth, we may steadfastly look up to heaven, and by faith behold the glory that shall be revealed, and being filled with the Holy Ghost, may learn to love and bless our persecutors. By the example of thy first martyr, St. Stephen, who prayed for his murderers to thee, O blessed Jesus, who standest at the right hand of God, to succour all those that suffer for thee, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Thank you very much for tuning in to the second episode of my crusade here on Getter. We will be back every Monday at 7pm GMT or 2pm EST. And up next is Matt Latousse's, uh I forgot the name of his show. I feel bad now. But Matt Latissier is up next. Uh, at 8 p.m. UK time. So go and watch that one if you are well-minded. Thank you very much again. And please keep the comments coming. My getter is Calvin Robinson. Drop me some posts on there for next week's episode. Any questions about anything, and I will happily answer them. And I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all at Calvin Robinson as well. It has been a delight sharing this time with you. I am off to nurse the rest of this this awful virus that's going around. That um, is an another result of the Conservative government locking everyone down for two years and not letting us share our normal germs and get our natural immunities up. But regardless, happy Christmas. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again. God bless. Okay, thank you. Um, before I ask you any questions about what's going on today, I have to caution you, which is just your rights, which is you do not have to say anything. It may harm your defence if you do not mention one question, something that you later on in court, anything you do say may be given you. Uh, what, what are you here for today? Uh, physically, I'm just standing here. Okay. Why, why here of all places? I know you, you don't live. Nearby. But this is an abortion something. Okay, that's why you're stood here. Is, is you standing here part of the protest? No, I'm not are you, protesting. Are you, are you praying? I, I might be praying in my head. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you once more, will you voluntarily come with us now to the police station for me to ask you some questions about today and other days where there are allegations that you've broken public spaces protection? Uh, if I've got a choice, then no. Okay, well then you're under arrest, I can't suspicion of failing to comply with the Public Spaces Protection Order, which is under the uh, Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act 2014. Now I'll caution you again, you do not have to say anything, it may harm your defence if you do not mention one question, something which you later on in court, anything you do say may be given in words. Do you understand the caution? I do. Okay. Um, your arrest is necessary in order for the prompt and effective investigation into the offence. What that means is so that I can ask you some questions. Vulnerable people, mainly service users in the clinic. Okay, um, so you'll come here now to the police station. Uh, you get booked in front of the custody sergeant, and then if you want a solicitor, you can have a solicitor on the limit. Okay, um, I don't tend to handcuff you, but obviously my, my colleague will search you because you're going to get to the police department. Make sure you don't have anything that needs to be armour, so you can just do that. Okay.
So is it okay we just take this clip out? Do you want to do it just because it's not? Let me know. Thank you. Could you sign me two four zero six? Two, six, you can go on this colour here. Thank you. So what we do with things like phones when you pop tea, you can hold it and it's recorded when you get to press tea. What we're doing for this gentleman, where you going? Which police station? Are you? 